the basic levels of the class system which we still recognize today crystallized during the 19th century into three major parts the lower or working class the middle class and the upper class and within each group people were defined mainly but not exclusively by their occupations and wealth the working class is comprised labourers, skilled and unskilled artisans, domestic servants, shop assistants, farm and factory workers, etc. The unemployed and poor formed the lowest levels of this class or were sometimes regarded as a separate class altogether. There were significant differences between groups within the working class. Skilled workers and craftsmen, for instance, not only were earning better wages than the unskilled, but also being perceived as of higher status. General education among the working class varied. While some had no education to speak of, others were able to read and write, and yet others had a decent standard of education, often a result of a desire for self-improvement. At the beginning of the 19th century, the only schools available to them were dame schools, operated on a private basis by women, or the ragged schools, organised by charities. As the century progressed, more schools were also provided by the churches. By the end of the century, the state had introduced compulsory education for children up to the age of 12. Living standards varied, as did accommodation, which ranged from overcrowded slums to simple terraced housing. The middle class, originally described as the middling sort, this expanding class comprised not just professionals, that is doctors, solicitors, clergy, the middle levels of the military and so on, but also those involved in trade and industry, that is business, property, commerce, banking, national and local government, shopkeepers, etc., and people who had risen from the working class through clerical and bureaucratic jobs, for instance clerks and office workers. Education was becoming very important to this class, especially as a means of advancement. It was provided by a mixture of private tutors, grammar schools and the lesser public schools. The general standard of living of the middle class was inevitably better than that of the working class. The upper class, these were the members of the aristocracy, both old and new, that is people with titles, and those with large fortunes and estates. Their education was supplied by the old public schools, such as Eton, Harrow, Winchester, and so on. As well as occupation and wealth, class differences also express themselves through manners, language, dress, social habits. One attitude notable about the other class was their disdain for people involved in trade or commerce. It's important to understand that although the distinctions between the classes were clearly recognised, there was considerable movement between them. It was unlikely that someone from the working class could ever make it into the upper class and be accepted in one generation, but many working class people did become middle class, and a fair number of successful entrepreneurs from middle class became upper class. It was also possible for members of the upper class particularly if they were feckless or unlucky, to find themselves slipping down the system. Much of your destiny would be shaped by the class into which you were born, but it was by no means the sole determining factor. The 19th century in Britain saw social mobility on a massive scale. The working classes were becoming better off and moving up into the middle class, which expanded accordingly. Now the central engine of industrial progress and development in the 19th century was capitalism, the simplest de definition of which is the private ownership of the means of production, sometimes known as capital, and distribution within a free market economy for the purpose of making a profit. Just about everything arose from that, books, magazines, textiles, home furnishings, the railways, the iron, steel, coal and shipbuilding industries, Beer, soft drinks, food, soap, bicycles, cars, typewriters, the telephone, whatever. Now, neither capitalism nor free markets existed in pure form, since there were always restrictions imposed on business by government, 
such as taxation, legislation governing working hours, import and export duties, etc. There was a constant political argument between those who favoured what was known as the laissez-faire approach, that is a setup in which private transactions were free of government intervention, and those who didn't. The literature of the period is replete with characters of all classes. Pip, in Great Expectations, for instance, is a working class boy who is moved up into the middle class by Magwitch's money. Joe Gargery, on the other hand, is working class and remains so. Lady Audley moves herself from working class to the upper class by marrying Sir Audley. His son, Robert Audley, is born into the upper class. Rochester and Jane Eyre is clearly upper class, and Jane, who becomes upper class by marrying him, starts off in the grey area between the upper working class and the lower middle class. As a governess, she has a special relationship with her employer, but is nevertheless still a servant. And people like Jaggers and Wemmick in Great Expectations are also members of the new and expanding middle class. So that's just a basic outline of the Victorian class system. Hopefully you'll find it useful.